So the portion this week is Vayetze, Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva. Jacob departed from Be'er Sheva, Vayewe Harana, and he went to Haran. Maybe we'll come back to that verse in a little bit, but I really want to focus on the next verse for now. Vayifkaba Makom, and he came to that place, he encountered the place, Vayelansham, and he slept in that place. Kiva Shemesh, because the sun had set. And he took from the stones of the place, and he placed them, he placed them at his head. And he lay down in that place. That's what Rashi says. And he lay down in that place. Rashi tells us. Rashi says, he lay down in that place. Specifically, only in that place did he finally go to sleep. In that place, he lay down. But there was another place where he didn't lay down. There were 14 years. There were 14 years. There were 14 years. There were 14 years. That he had served. He had served in a yeshiva. Of shame the ever. We'll see who they are in a moment. During those 14 years, he never he never slept at all at night. Shahaya Osek Torah. He was studying Torah. What's this a reference to? Rashi is saying in this place he slept, but there were 14 years prior to this that he never slept. And that's when he was studying in the yeshiva of shame the ever. You know who Shem is? Shem is the son of Noah. Noah had three sons. Now, Shem, Cham, and Yafet. Now, where do we get this idea from that he spent 14 years studying in yeshiva? It's not written in the text. So Rashi, at the end of the previous portion, the end of last week's portion, goes through the chronology. And by his calculations, he determines that Jacob was away for, from his father for 36 years. And since he was away for 36 years, he was punished for 22 of those years that Joseph stayed away from him. But he wasn't punished for 14 years. So Rashi, therefore, in the, in the says... There were 14 years that he studied in the yeshiva of Shem the Aver. And only afterwards did he go to Haran. Studied for 14 years in this yeshiva. And that's, and that's a time where he wasn't punished for being away from his father. So just to summarize what we've seen, it says in the verse, verse 11, chapter 28, verse 11, Parshas Vayetze, Jacob slept in that place. Rashi says in that place he slept, but he didn't sleep when he was in yeshiva studying. And these were the 14 years for which he wasn't punished for not obeying his father. But he was punished for the 14 years. He was, for the 22 years, that he was with Rachel and Leah working in the fields. But he wasn't punished for those 14 years staying in yeshiva because it was so important and pressing for him to be there that that was essential. What's going on with this Rashi? What's this, what's this Rashi all about? So I saw a commentary. Well, first of all, I saw a commentary by Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky on this Rashi. And I want to do, explain it. I wanted to read it to you. This is a powerful idea of Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the leading rabbis of the generation when I was maybe uh, in grade school. A giant, a giant. So the question is, what's the significance of this idea that Yaakov studied 14 years in a yeshiva? And why did he have to go to the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever? We already saw Rashi says that Rebecca went and studied and went to, to inquire in that yeshiva. Instead of talking to her own husband, 
for talking to Abraham, she went to the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever. Every time she'd walk past uh, a yeshiva, her son Jacob would want to get out. But when she walked past a house of idolatry, Asa would want to get out and participate. And she said, what's going on here? And she went to study in that, and she went to ask them in that yeshiva what was going on. So, before I go on and read Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, hold on. So, he says, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says as follows. Chazal Mosrim Wanu, our rabbis teach us that in truth, Jacob was punished because he was weak in this matter of honoring their father and mother. Esav, this was the one area where Esav was better than Jacob in honoring their father. Esav was better than Jacob in this one area. And so therefore, for this reason, because Jacob fell short, he was weak in this area of honoring thy father. For this reason, Joseph was absent from his house for 22 years. But for those 14 years that he was in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, Jacob was not punished. Jacob was not punished for those, for those years. It must be that those 14 years in the yeshiva were so essential to Jacob's spiritual growth that they overcame the obligation to honor thy father and mother. Jacob needed to be there so badly, it was more important for him to be there than to be at home. He needed to be in the yeshiva. He needed to be honoring his, his he needed to be in the yeshiva studying, more important than honoring his father and mother. So, Yaakov Kamenetsky, the MS Yaakov, is very shocked by this. He says, I don't understand. According to Rashi's calculations, how old was Rashi? How old was Jacob when he left his home? He wasn't a kid. He wasn't 18 years old. That's what age they go to the yeshivas. He wasn't 14. According to Rashi's calculation, he was 63 years old. He was 63 years old. So because this is determined by Rashi by the chronology, moving backwards. It's based upon Joseph's age and how old Jacob was when he went down to Egypt. So Jacob was 63 years old when he left his home and from Beersheba. And we know that Rashi tells us in last portion, chapter 25, verse 27, that Jacob had studied Torah with whom? Who did he study Torah with? He studied Torah with his father, Abraham, until he reached the age of 15. We know that the patriarchs and the matriarchs kept all the commandments of the Torah. They knew how to keep each mitzvah. They had tremendous divine inspiration. They knew the essence of the mitzvah. They might not have known all of the details like the rabbinic laws that we do, but they kept all the essential aspects because they knew the Torah. But we know that he studied with his father, with his grandfather until he was 15. And Rambam says that from that point on, he studied in the yeshiva of his father Yitzchak. So Jacob was studying with Abraham and Isaac. So what could he possibly have been missing? Abraham and Isaac were the greatest scholars. They were the leaders for all of the eternity of the Jewish people. They are our patriarchs. Abraham and Isaac. Why does he need to go to this yeshiva of shame, the Aver? They're not known. They're not known as our patriarchs. Shame, the Aver are not. We don't say when we say the Amida. Blessed are you, the God of shame and Aver. We said, blessed are you, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So why is he going to the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever? That's the question that Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky is asking. So Rabbi Yaakov says, 
why if that's the case, if Jacob had been studying, if Yaakov Avinu had been studying for many years with his greatest two teachers of all time, Abraham and Isaac, why if that's the case, why all of a sudden now, now when his father told him, go to Haran, go get married, he said, wait, I need to go for 14 years to the yeshiva. <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, you need to go? You're 63 years old. Now you want to go study in the yeshiva? Now you want to go for your PhD? No, you're 63. It's time to get married. That's what they're telling him. It's 63. Enough studying. Time to get married. His parents had told him to go and live with Lavan. For, for several years. Uh, Sheva, why now all of a sudden does he have to sit and study 14 years? And specifically in this yeshiva. What can he learn in this yeshiva that he wasn't able to learn from the greatest teachers of Abraham and Isaac? And then he writes, Nevertheless, and even though uh, he was growing in Torah during those 14 years, for sure, Okay, he was sitting and studying in the yeshiva. He didn't even sleep for 14 years. Even though he he, he grew in Torah, nevertheless, that shouldn't take away. How does that take him away from the mitzvah of honoring his father and mother? He has to take care of his elderly parents. So, so Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky strengthens the question. He says, What's it like? It's like if a father asks his son to go buy him something. On the way to the shop, the son decides that he wants to study Torah. <laughs> the father says, go buy me a newspaper. On the way there, the son says, you know what? I want to go study in the yeshiva. And he sits down. To, to study. Is now the time to study? No, your father asked you to do something. You can't all of a sudden say, well, now I want to study. So Talmud's Torah study is going to be overridden by something that can't be done by other people. If your father asks you to do something, you do that even before you're studying the Torah. So why was Yaakov Avinu excused for studying in the yeshiva for 14 years? So I see, the, oh, hold on, let me pause for a second. Let me pause. Okay. It says, in order for us to understand the urgency, the urgency of Jacob to go now to go now and study in this specific yeshiva of Shem Ever. We first need to understand at that Torah Mukhadet. We have to understand what was so special about this yeshiva. What was so special about this yeshiva that Jacob went to study? What was different? Why was this yeshiva so different from the Torah of Abraham and Isaac? What was so different about it? Zoktara says, Rabbi Yaakov, Ha'avos, Ha'yoshev in the yeshiva. It says this, we learned this in the Gemara in Yoma 28b, the patriarch sat and studied in the yeshiva. Avram sat and studied, Yitzhak sat and studied in the yeshiva, and they were teaching Torah for everybody who came to them. They opened up a base medrash. They opened up a yeshiva in the middle of the town. Nobody there was studying in the yeshiva. They opened up, whoever came in, they started to study and to share from their teachings. But what did they teach in their yeshiva? The base medrash and shalavos. In the in the base medrash of the patriarchs, they taught Torah on a very high level. They taught about faith and service of Hashem. They taught what does it mean to have faith in God? What does it mean to serve Hashem? And but in their yeshiva, where were they? They were they were completely fortified and completely sheltered from the surrounding areas, from the surrounding world, 
which had no influence upon them whatsoever. They were cloistered. They were cloistered. Abraham and Isaac in their yeshiva. Excuse me, they were cloistered from the whole world. Nobody could get in there. They created this environment, this very special spiritual environment that nobody could get into. Nobody, no out, they didn't get the newspaper there. They shut off the internet. Nobody had access to the to the people when they were studying in the yeshiva of Abraham and Isaac. And for this reason, this is the reason it says, says Rabbi Yaakov, that when Sarah saw Yishmael was being nitzachek, this was in Parshas Vayera, she saw that Yishmael was being mitzachek with Yitzchak, and he was having an influence on him. Rashi says she saw him teaching him either about murder or about adultery or idolatry. What did she do? She said, get rid of this woman, get rid of this maidservant and her son. Because around these holy righteous people, there was no space for somebody of Yishmael's type. And Hashem agreed with her. Hashem said, you have to garish esamazot. You have to get rid. He says, oh, everything that your wife Sarah says, you have to listen to her. Shema b'kohal, listen to the sound of Sarah. And so therefore, that was what was going on in the yeshiva was of Avram and Yitzchak. They were in very special places, but they were sequestered. They were cloistered from the world. But that's not what was going on in the yeshiva of Shame the Aver, who is uh, who is who is Shame. This is the totally different yeshiva. Who is Shame? Who is Shame? Shame is the son of Noah. Noah had had survived the generation of the flood. He was not only saved from the waters of the flood. Shame was not only saved from the waters of the flood. Shame was not only saved from the generation, from the waters of the flood, he was saved from the evil ways of the generation of the flood, from their corrupt, disgusting ways. And we know... That where did shame learn this? He learned this from his father Noah. That Noah was so successful in saving his family from the influence of the generation of the flood. This is the Torah of exile. The Torah when you're surrounded by wicked people, and that's what Noah gave to shame. That's what Noah gave to shame, and shame was going to give it to Jacob. And Jacob, I'm cutting ahead of the story, was going to give it to whom? He's going to give it to who, who needs a Torah of exile? Who needs to know how to survive in exile? Joseph. The Torah. Joseph is going to need it from Jacob. So going back to the text of Rabbi, of the Torah Semes, of the Amos Liakov. So shame was saved not only from the flood, but also from the ways of the people of the flood. But, and who's Aver? Aver was born... And he lived during the generation of the Hafwaga, Dor Hafwaga, which is the generation of the dispersion, i.e. the generation of the Tower of Bavel. That these people wanted to build a tower and the tower would go up to the sky because these people wanted in the rabbinic tradition to rebel against Hashem. But Aver withstood them. He didn't go after them. He remained righteous. He remained in his righteousness. So only shame and Aver who were the remnants from these generations of those people and where they were surrounded by complete wickedness. Only they, and not Abraham and Isaac, only they could teach to Jacob the Torah that he needed in order to remain in his purity around Lavan, in the, in the area around Lavan, who was a wicked and corrupt man. Meaning to say, Jacob needed to learn how to deal with Lavan, and he couldn't learn that from Abraham and Isaac. That would not work. He had to learn it from, he had to learn it from, he had to learn it from shame and Aver. Not Lavan, not only Lavan, but all the people of Lavan's place were wicked because we know that Lavan gathered all these people and made a party. And there was not one person at this party 
who said, oh, Lavan is trying to trick you. As it says in the Midrash, Bereshit Rabba, that all of them were, uh, were meaning to say that all of them were involved in this deceit. All of them. Meaning to say everybody there knew that Leah was being switched out for Rachel, or Rachel was being switched out for Leah, and nobody opened their mouth. It's like uh, everybody was aware of this. And nobody said anything. That's what I was thinking today when I saw this, uh, that the Jewish, that the hostages from Israel were brought straight into the front door of the Shifa hospital. All the people who were there knew about this. Nobody said anything. The newspapers, the people living there, nobody said anything. And and so, so too, all the people around Laban, they knew what was going on. They knew that the joke was being played on Jacob, that he was being tricked. Yaakov needed to know how to live amongst wicked people, dishonest people, and nevertheless to remain pious and straight. And for this, he couldn't use the base medrash of, of Avram, the base medrash of Yitzhak. He needed the base medrash of Shem Ve'ever, people who had survived with their spirituality intact, not just physically, from living amongst wicked people. And for this reason, for this reason, Yaakov couldn't have fulfilled the command of his father to go straight to the house of Lavan. He needed to stop. Even though he was 63, he had lived his whole life. He had been living in a tent in, in a cloist, cloistered society. If he would have gone straight, he went to work. He needed to stop and spend 14 years in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever. Because for sure, Jacob's parents did not want that he'd go to Lavan unless, if at the end, he would be able to come out and say, I dwelt with the living, wicked Lavan, and I was still able to keep all the mitzvahs. And I didn't learn from his ways. If he was going to go to Lavan and become like Lavan, what's the point? in telling him to marry a specific woman to come back and be a leader of the Jewish people if he would have been absorbed into the ways of Lavan. And so therefore, by stopping in the yeshiva and fortifying himself to be able to go to Lavan's house, in this way, he's fulfilling the command of his father properly because he knows what his father wants. His father doesn't want him just to go to Lavan. His father wants him to remain committed to the God of Abraham and Isaac. So therefore, what the muscle we gave before was the parable was of uh, a man who a boy whose father sent him out to the store, and the son decides to study Torah. But that's not a good parable. What's this like? This is like a father who tells the son, "Go buy for me a lula for esrog for sukkis." And on the way to the store, the son has to stop because he says, I don't know what a kosher lulav is. I don't know what a kosher esrog is. And he says, I need to, I need to stop at the, at the base medrash at the yeshiva and to, and, to, and to brush up on what's kosher or not. Would you say that by stopping, he's not fulfilling the mitzvah of his father? Of course, they're part and parcel of the same idea. In order to fulfill the mitzvah, you need to first stop and see if it's kosher. So the Gemara says, Indeed, says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, just the opposite. This is how he fulfills the mitzvah. In his completeness is only by first stopping. And if he hadn't stopped first, he would have bought his father a lemon or an orange. He wouldn't have known what to buy. And so too Yaakov, without stopping in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, he would not have been able to fulfill this commandment of his father and go to the house of Lavan and its surrounding areas. But now we take it one step further. We take this one step further. What are we taking one step further? Next week's parsha is Vayishlach. And after that, we get to Vayeshev. And in chapter 37 of Vayeshev, we read about the sale of Joseph. But it says in that chapter that Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was Ben Zikunim, because he was a son of Zikunim. And what does that mean? Rashi says it means he was the wisest. Baruch Kimhu. He was very wise. And what's the answer? Rashi says there in this in the commentary on his 
on his Torah, Rashi says, he taught him everything, Yaakov taught him everything he had learned in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever. Everything he had learned in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, he taught to, he taught to, he taught to, he taught to Joseph. So what is what did he teach him? Why did Rashi say he had to teach him everything he learned in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever? What was he teaching him? So, and why did he why did he not teach it to his other sons? So Rav Yaakov was going to tell us he knew Joseph was destined for greatness. He knew Joseph was going to be living in exile. He knew, and he had a tradition from Abraham that they were going to live in a land that didn't belong to them. And so Yaakov needed to prepare his sons for this exile. And so therefore, what did he do? He knew that Yosef was the one who was going to be living amongst the wicked people. And so therefore, he needed to withstand all of these tests. And so therefore, upon him, he had to prepare him for this. And so therefore, how was he able to prepare him? Only by teaching him what's it like to live amongst wicked people. So therefore, that's why Yaakov was teaching him this, this stuff that he learned in this yeshiva. But the brothers, they didn't understand why Yaakov was giving this 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 teachings over to Joseph. They didn't realize that Yaakov understood that Joseph was going to be the one to be living amongst the exiled nations. And so therefore they were jealous. They thought only he is going to get the Torah. They didn't understand. But they didn't understand the difference between the Torah of the patriarchs, which they were getting, Abraham and Isaac, because they were living in their cloistered society versus the Torah of Joseph, which was the Torah of Yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever. And so therefore, for this reason... So therefore, for this reason, Jacob had, that's what Jacob had to teach Joseph, the special Torah that was taught in the yeshiva of Shem Eva. So, so, so that's what Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky is saying. Just to summarize, just to repeat it, and then to summarize, he's teaching us that Yaakov needed to spend those 14 years as preparation for the world, because he wouldn't have been able to just go out into the world just upon, just based upon what his own parents had taught him. That would not have been enough. And that's the first approach to why he stopped in the yeshiva for 14 years to study Torah. Let me just pause for a moment, see if anybody has... Moshe Feinstein has another approach to this, that he says, Jacob left from Mereshev and he went to Haran. So this is what he says. He comments, he says this Dvar Torah, on the first, on the first verse, it says Jacob went from Be'er Sheva, and it went to Haran. Now Rashi's explanation, Rashi has to explain why does Jacob, why does it have to say Jacob left from Be'er Sheva and he went to Haran? So Rashi's explanation is that it's to highlight how incredible a tzaddik he was, and that Yaakov was, and then when a tzaddik leaves a place, it makes a mark on the place. It makes the place from something beautiful that when a tzaddik departs, they're, lo they're losing the beauty of the place. When a tzaddik departs, they're losing the beauty. So that's what that's what Ramosha Feinstein has to tell us there. But Ramosha, excuse me, that's what Rashi wants to tell us. But, but Ramosha Feinstein tells us something else. Ramosha Feinstein says, it's telling us that the Torah is comparing the two. That that Yaakov's travel to Haran was with the same will and desire to serve Hashem as his departure from Beersheba. Yaakov left Beersheba knowing he'd have to prepare himself for a stay in Haran. He had to strengthen himself, lest he be weakened by the actions of the wicked people. So basically it's the same idea that Jacob that Jacob understood that what he was going into now was this tremendous test, the spiritual test by, by, by leaving his home and being surrounded by wicked people. He, has an, uh, he compares this to another verse, which we have in Shemos. It says that, it says the people who were coming to Egypt, so 
Why does it say this verse, the people who are coming to Egypt, it says it at the end of the book of Barachis, and it says in the beginning of Shemos. In the end of Barachis, it makes sense, because they hadn't yet come down. But in Shemos, they've already been living there for many years. So basically, what it means is, says Ramosha Feinstein, that it's to tell us that after they lived for many years in Egypt, their mindset did not change. That that they they have the that they were sojourners. They needed to strengthen themselves against their environment. This is a very powerful idea because when is when do we need to strengthen ourselves against the spiritual challenges of the environment around us? You might think that you need to strengthen yourself right when you get there, but that's actually just the opposite. The when do when do when's the greatest threat? to assimilation, not when we're just coming to the society, but when we've been in the society for many years and we become comfortable in the society, that becomes our greatest threat. And that's why he gives an answer, or Moshe Feinstein gives an answer, that's why Moshe Rabbeinu named his oldest child Gershon, which means I was a stranger, I was a stranger there. And then his second son, he names Eliezer, my God, the helper. So with this with the second name, Moshe is acknowledging that Hashem saved him when Paro wanted to have him killed. So but Rav Moshe finds he asks, he should have done it reverse. First he was saved, and only then afterwards he say, I was a stranger in the land. So Moshe, why did Moshe do this? That Moshe understood that unless he managed to remain the same stranger to to the lands of Midianite that he was when he first arrived, then his salvation from power would have been meaningless. So therefore he named his first child Gershom, and only after he survived for many years, when he or after or when he survived, when he realized he was spiritually strong, that was he able to name his second son Eliezer. That but the basic point in our emotion finds him, which we have to take, is this constant challenge, the struggle to to maintain our identity in the face of being around people who are who are presenting a spiritual challenge to us. This is what this is what Jacob needed to fortify himself for. And this is in, and in the same way, Ramosha Feinstein, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, the contemporaries, they saw this and they're living in America, living surrounded by the the uh, the challenges of the American Jewish of the American world, they saw that they saw that problem. The um the Lubavitcher Rebbe takes a little bit different approach because remember, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky and Ramosha Feinstein, they saw the enemy, they saw the world around them as a threat to their spiritual existence. But the Lubavitcher Rebbe saw the world around us not so much as a threat to our spiritual existence. But more than that, he saw it as a opportunity to engage with other Jews, and not just other Jews, to engage in the world which we have discarded and we think is not spiritual enough. So the Babaj Rebbe is going to always look at this opportunity uh, as Jacob going to the house of Lavan as an opportunity to elevate himself, to elevate the people that were there. Unlike Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky and Ramosha Feinstein, who view it as a tremendous threat, he's going to view it as an opportunity. It's just a methodological distinction between, between these two approaches. So let me read to you what the what the Rebbe says here. So it says, that Jacob left Be'er Sheva. And so what does it mean that Jacob left Be'er Sheva? It says as follows. Jacob's leaving the holy environment of the land of Israel and descending to the less than holy environment of Haran in order to challenge Lavan Harami, and they understand the Arami as the deceiver, not the Arami, and Lavan's name is the deceiver, endows us, his progeny, with the strength to follow along a similar path. Meaning to say, the Rebbe is encouraging us to follow that path. That's the this is the, just unbelievable creativity and greatness of the Rebbe. Is he's telling us that's the path we're supposed to follow. 
It's just shocking. That's the path we're supposed to follow. Don't cloister ourselves away from it. See, for Jacob, for Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, and for Moshe Weinstein, you see that they understood it was a necessary evil. But for the Obama Rebbe, he views it as a necessary challenge to bring the Mashiach. True, our home environment should be a haven, says the Rebbe, from the materialistic world, permeated with the Torah's wholesome and holy values. However, once we have established such a home, we do not have to be afraid to venture into the outside world in order to elevate reality. Again, the Rebbe is saying, don't be afraid. If you're coming from a strong place, don't be afraid to go out into the world to elevate reality. And just as Jacob's descent to Haran propelled him to great spiritual heights, I mean to say when Yaakov went to Haran, he achieved his greatness for the first time. He, 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 he built B'nai Israel. He achieved his greatness. The same holds true for us. Our temporary forays into the non-spiritual milieu of the material world with the aim of elevating it will not only not have a detrimental effect on us, they will actually prove beneficial to our spiritual to our spiritual growth as well. In fact, the only way we can grow is by taking our on the challenges of our personal haram. So yeah, so basically the Rebbe is saying that that this was essential. And just like it was essential for Yaakov, it's also going to be essential for us. The only way we can grow is by taking on the challenges of the personal Haran. Unlike Rabbi Yaakov, who felt that it was sufficient for the other brothers to stay and study in the yeshiva and just learn the Torah of the patriarchs of Avram and Yitzhak, the Rebbe would ne never adopt that approach. The Rebbe said, no, that's not our destiny. Our destiny is to find our personal Haran. We have to be willing to go to those places where it's spiritually challenging and assume that we have been studying up until this point and been strengthened and we can go out. So therefore, he makes this point. This is the, he makes this point as well. He, uh, I'll, I'll just say a couple of more sentences from the Rebbe where he makes this point as well. He says, Be'er Sheba was named Be'er Sheba, the, the well of the oath, the covenant of the peace between Avram and Avimelech. The this covenant, so it says Jacob left from Be'er Sheba. He left from the covenant of peace. Because that covenant that Avram made enabled Avram and his descendants to live a, a pure life, a spiritual life, without Avimelech interfering. But Yaakov had to leave Beersheba. He wasn't content to live like that, just to live a life unhindered by Avimelech. That's not sufficient. Because Yaakov's approach to evil differed so dramatically from that of Abraham and Isaac. Yet Abram and Yitzhak were able to make peace with Avimelech, but they weren't able to vanquish his evil. And they weren't able to bring him over to their ways of holiness. So Yaakov, according to the Rebbe, unlike unlike. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, Yaakov went to Haran not only to prevent its culture from hindering him, but to transform it. That's what the Rebbe says. So since Avram and Yitzhak were unable to transform the evil of their opponents, they didn't attempt to do so. So therefore, they were unable to transform the, the evil propensities of their own children, of Yishmael, and Esav, they only succeeded in neutralizing their children's opposition. But Yaakov learned, this is the powerful idea, because Yaakov learned how to transform the culture in which he was, so too he was able to transform 
the evil that was in his children. And so therefore, at the end of their life, they all followed in the path of Hashem. That's why Yaakov is believed to have mitaso shlema, a complete bed, a complete path, unlike, unlike all the other patriarchs, because Yaakov studied how to transform the wickedness, therefore all of his children were able to reach the proper path. Okay, so that's the message that I wanted to share today. Very powerful message.